Today uh, was to be the first Sunday uh, in our sermon series, 2020 Was My Teacher. I, I want to reflect with you on some things we might want to remember in this otherwise forgettable year. Sometimes there are things that happen that if we pay attention to them, they can teach us something about ourselves and about our faith. But sometimes things happen and we don't have time to reflect. The, the question or the concern, it follows us and it meets us here in this time of worship and demands that we reflect on it from our perspective of faith. This has been just such a week. We had recorded our service uh, prior to the stunning events on Wednesday. It included the sermon that was advertised, it's not good to be alone, and maybe we'll have that sermon included in a future worship service. But we've re-recorded some parts of this service, other parts we've kept. But today I'll speak not about that sermon, it's, good, it's not good to be alone, but I want to speak about what our faith teaches us about how communities should be governed. Our scripture for today is Philippians, the fourth chapter. I'll be reading verses 8 and 9. As we come to this passage, uh, join with me first for a word of prayer. Gracious God, because you are God, it is your word that is life for us. And because you are gracious, we trust that you will speak to us even now, O oh God. We are here. We are listening. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us listen for God's word for us. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. We have lived through an unprecedented week. You know, sometimes we come to worship and we just want to leave all of that behind. We want a little sanctuary. We want a little peace and quiet. I get that. I want that in worship sometimes too. But to confess that Jesus is Lord is to confess that the ways of Jesus shape and inform every aspect of our lives. There is nothing in the world that lies beyond the perspective of faith. Every moment of your life matters to God, and every moment of our communal life matters to God as well. As Presbyterians, we really make no distinction between the secular and the sacred. As the psalmist says, the earth and all that is therein belongs to God. I'll tell you a time where we got that wrong. It was 1861. I've told you this before. Do you remember? James Henley Thornwell, uh, the, the brightest theological mind of his time, he wrote an open letter explaining the necessity of a new denomination, a Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America, it was called. It later changed its name and was informally just known as the Southern Presbyterian Church. It is the denomination that taught me that Jesus Christ is Lord. But in December of 1861, the most significant moral issue of the day, and probably of any day, was of course slavery. Thornwell's letter, which was adopted by this new denomination, in this letter, it affirmed that there's no inconsistency between being a follower of Jesus Christ and an owner of slaves. How did they rationalize that? They did it this way. They said that the existence of slavery was a matter of the state and therefore separated from matters of faith. To quote Thornwell, he said, the existence of slavery is beyond the sphere 
of the church or of God. As a result, to enslave people, the church said, God doesn't care. The church was wrong. There is nothing that God fails to care about. There is nothing beyond the sphere with respect to God. To confess that Jesus Christ is Lord is to confess that he's Lord of of everything, of all of life. So every week, but particularly in weeks where there have been tragic or painful or dangerous things happen in the world, it is our calling to reflect upon them from the perspective of our own faith, from the teachings of Jesus. I endeavor to do that with you every time I preach, at least to do so as I understand the text. And as I do... I know that I may not be right. I know that. And I know that some of you might see it differently than I do, and I respect that. I can't be sure that I'm right, but I will endeavor to be honest. And I'm doing that again today. On Wednesday... The workings of our democracy was attacked, both by ordinary citizens and by those who hold elected office. People lost their lives. The building that is the center of our common life was desecrated. Urged by the president to stop the steal, democracy itself was attacked. I was I was shaken by what I saw. I imagine you were as well. I've become increasingly aware that America is not a given. She should not be treated casually. It's a lot easier to tear something down than it is to build something up. To build something up requires character. So this is a moment when our faith actually has some very important things to teach us. I've been Presbyterian all my life. If someone tells you that they're Presbyterian, you don't necessarily know what they think about things. You don't necessarily know their doctrine. Uh, Different Presbyterians have very different doctrine from one another. But what you do know about them, if someone says that they're Presbyterian, you know how they make decisions. You know the values that they hold for how a community ought to make decisions. To be Presbyterian is to recognize that certain values are needed for good governance. I want to share what I think our faith teaches us about good governance, at least as I understand it. As Presbyterians... We believe, firstly, that decisions are best made in groups. (laughs) People make fun of us as a church held together by committee because there there are more efficient ways to make decisions. Uh, Catholics and Episcopalians and Methodists, to a lesser extent, they're they're more efficient than we are because they, they... they place greater power in the hands of individuals, bishops and a pope. But Presbyterians are suspicious of any individual having too much power. That's because we believe that nobody escapes the power of sin. Even the best person, even the most righteous person, if that person has the power to make decisions here or there, now and then, that person will make bad decisions, even evil decisions, sometimes out of selfish intent, yes but even more so out of a blindness, an inability to see what others might see, an inability to see the value and perspective of the other. And when a person has power, the consequences of their sin are often borne by those who have less power. If the decision about the common good is not made by one person but by groups, then there's a, there's a check. 
there's a check to that power. There's a check to the consequences of that individual's sin. When decisions are made in groups, then, then my view has to come into, in, has to encounter another view, a different perspective. I get pushed to see what I might not have seen before, but what you're able to see. And the common good is therefore better served. The group is a check on human sin. Now look, just because a group makes a decision doesn't mean it's a good decision. Groups can make bad decisions. A whole Presbyterian denomination decided that slavery was just fine with God. But we know that groups more consistently take a broader perspective than I might take on my own. I need the wisdom of others. One of the first things our Presbyterian faith teaches us is that the common good is better served when decisions are made by groups. But that's not all. A second value of good governance is honesty. Communities are not sustainable apart from truth. This week, citizens stormed the Capitol in an effort to disrupt the Congress's job to record the electoral vote. I imagine they all have social media feeds filled with conspiracy theories. They follow QAnon or they listen to Alex Jones or Rush Limbaugh or they read Epic News or some other propagandizing platform. And then the president, he spins his web of falsehood after falsehood after falsehood. Even as citizens were storming the Capitol, he claimed that he won this election in a landslide and that the election was stolen. And this simply is not true. And even after the brazen attack yesterday, senators and congresspersons rose up to claim widespread election fraud. They are inviting a distrust in democracy, and their claims are unsubstantiated, and they are dangerous. Even before the danger of this week, election workers, many of them claiming they had voted for the president themselves, informed us that they were receiving threats to their safety. How many courts have to say there's no evidence of fraud? To attack truth is dangerous because without some recognized truth, communal life is not sustainable. Communities cannot hold. It is hard. It is hard to build a community. It's easy to tear it apart. And dishonesty is a tool of destruction. There are a vast array of voices who create out of whole cloth narratives that have no basis in truth. They claim that the world is flat, that Sandy Hook never happened, that the deep state exists to run a pornography ring, or that the election was stolen. It is incumbent upon us as citizens to seek the truth, to honor facts, and to live in the real world, not a world of fiction. America is a great nation. But America is not a given. Without truth, no democracy stands. Our Presbyterian faith it teaches us to be suspicious of individual power, to be relentless in the search of truth. But it also teaches us the importance of your own voice. In 1788, the church church amended the book of order to include this principle. It said, God alone is Lord of the conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. That means that you and you alone stand before God. You are responsible for your own wisdom and your own faith. The session can't tell you what to think. The preacher can't tell you what to think. There is no intermediary between you and God. You do not bow down before anyone. You only bow before God. This is a reason you often hear me say, if I understand the text. I am saying to you and to me, actually, this is how I see it. 
but you may see it differently. How do you see the truth of this text, of this tradition? What do you see? Because God alone is Lord of your conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And that means you should speak the truth that you know. But there's a partner value to this. And the partner value is this. You speak your truth, but we respect the decision of the majority. You may not agree with the decision of the majority. I haven't all the time. I disagree with my own denomination at times. I may not agree. I might strenuously object to the wisdom presented by the majority, and I can work to change the wisdom of the majority, but I won't overthrow it. But we saw this week both in the mob as well as from the voices of power was a practice of governance devoid, devoid of these values. And it hurts us. And here's where I fear we are all culpable. It is common, it is common to speak of government in derisive and cynical terms. It is common to speak of government as if government itself is the problem, as if we would be better off, we would be more free somehow if there were no government at all. Government is not the problem. No community, not this church, not this city, not your school, not your place of work, not this nation, no community is sustainable apart from governance. The question is, what are the values that shape our governance? I've been Presbyterian all my life. The, the Presbyterian church, this stumbling, fragile, even sinful communion of saints, has been my primary teacher regarding the values that shape communal life. And these values were ignored this week to the peril of the nation that we love. What we have witnessed in our recent history is the erosion of community when governance is practiced devoid of these values. I don't know if the values are being rejected or if there's just some deep dementia that has washed these values from our communal memory. They need to be rehearsed. They need to be remembered. These values need to be remembered and they need to be rehearsed like the Apostle Paul teaches us. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set your mind to these things. Hold fast to these things. This is what brings peace. But the thing about these values is they aren't a given. They, they're not built into any system of governance. They, they have to be chosen. Values, character, morals, they have to be chosen and brought to the governance process. Rather than becoming enslaved to our own cynicism, it is time for us to remember these truths that we know. It is time for us to hold fast to these values that they might be chosen and no longer ignored. Now I look, you might be thinking, hey preacher, this is a civic matter. It's not to be addressed in the worship of God. Well, Thornwell said the same thing in 1861, but I think differently. I think particularly now, we need to remember what our faith teaches us about how communities should be governed. It's time for us to bring our values to the communal life. As the Apostle Paul instructs, think about these things. Think about what we've seen and known and heard. Let us focus on these things and the God of peace will be known. When groups be they sessions empowered by the vote of the congregation or government officials empowered by the vote of the people, when groups gather to make decisions, if they do so only to maintain power or to increase power or to exercise power, the common good always suffers. 
But when those entrusted with power for the common good recognize they are servants of the public, when they not only endeavor to understand the truth, but to stand under the truth, and when they speak their voice with conviction, but also humility, the common good can be served. And serving the common good is the purpose of government. At least, that is what my Presbyterian faith has taught me. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.